suggesting that we could be in breach of international law or, or, or anything like that, well, any war is, it runs the risk of breaching all kinds of conventions and all kinds of laws. So I, I don't find that sort of particularly compelling. All that this would do is irritate our Israeli allies. And, you know, it, people can have a discussion as to whether or not the UK should be allied with Israel or not, but we are. I, well, yeah, we the are. thing is, I, I think we, we can have a discussion about anything. Yeah. Um, and when I say, I've actually said to people, you know, I know, but I said to people, you know, our ally, the Israel thing, Oh, there are. Oh, they are ally. Yeah, they're the only yeah. functioning democracy in the Middle East. And yeah, Netanyahu, not a fan. No. Neither are many people in Israel. They have a coalition government. Oh, but by the way, if you're in favour of PR, that's the sort of thing you I could mean, end up this, with. This is the curious thing, isn't it? Because everybody talks about Israel as being a sort of a Western country, a Western military. It's not. And just because their mores and their sort of customs and the way that they deal with us is dis is different, people seem to, th you know, you often hear that. Are they actually our friends? Well, yes, they are. Just because they, you know, they talk to you like they are a Middle Eastern country, which they are, yeah. people seem to think, living oh, they're a, a little war bit with us. Living in a war zone. Yeah, I mean, that, I do think people have to, again, I've said it a million times since October the 7th, you know, imagine mm. if that had happened on our territory, mm. what we would be doing right now. But again, I think you'd have these former Supreme Court justice uh, saying exactly the same thing. Mm. Now, look, two of them are sort of, you know, you, you, you know, usual suspects. Um, they are Lady Hale, remember former president, remember her during the, the battles over mm. Brexit um, and the, the suspension of parliament, prorogation of parliament, uh, but also um, Lord Sump Lord Wilson, also Lord Sumption. Now, Lord Sumption was an absolute hero during mm. lockdown, we're arguing for our freedoms and the like. So he's not perhaps the usual suspect. Um, look, I, I want there to be do-gooders in this country. It's one of the things mm. we've got about being a civilised, you know, Western nation, is that people do speak out and that people are concerned about civilian death. Everybody should be concerned about every single loss of life of a civilian mm. in Gaza. Uh, you know, children, women, oh yes, and men. Can we care about men? Are we allowed to care about men and not just care mm. about women anymore uh, dying? Now, yes, an awful lot of these men and women will have been radicalised. They're not necessarily a Hamas fighter, but they've been radicalised, they support Hamas. Mm. They've been raised on, by the way, a UN aid agency funded education system, which tells them the best thing you can do in life, your aim in life is to mm. kill as many Jews as possible. That is literally what is in the books given to children in primary school uh, in, in, uh, in, in Hamas run Gaza. To be a martyr is a glory. Be, yeah. That's so, the, so you know, I mean, that, you know, you think about our PC dressing up at Halloween. You know, mm. dressing up as a Hamas fighter is like a normal thing there, for God's sake. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we want those people to lose their lives. Should the West, should Britain, do we have a duty of care? Should we be doing more to prevent that loss of life? Should we be? <laughs> Be strong arming Israel as such as we can? This is a really strange thing. To, to prevent the loss of life, our weapons supplies that we give to the Israelis will have no impact at all. All it would do is just upset it's it. nothing. It, it is such a tiny proportion. Israel is going to do this regardless of what we say because that is why Israel exists, so that the Jewish people, should they choose to live in Israel, are not beholden to other governments, other nations, other for ethnic minorities safety. for their safety because history suggests that's not a good thing. That's why we have to keep remembering. This is why Israel behaves in the way it is because it's learned from the past that if you you try to give people the benefit of the doubt, if you give the people who say they hate you the benefit of the doubt, they come and they kill you. Yeah, th that's why this is happening. And you've got to say, actually, you look at the reaction of other countries in the region. Yes, publicly, a lot of the Arab countries, they say, it's appalling, it's unacceptable, we can't have this. Lots of other countries say that. Ha not one of them is going to risk the peace deal. Egypt, Jordan, they yeah. all said explicitly, peace is, you know, it's non-negotiable. We're not taking the Abraham Accords off the table. We're not going to cancel our peace treaties because we've learned the hard way. Actually, this is preferable it's to also, what Hamas and Iran want. A lot of what um, Middle Eastern um, Arab governments have to say mm. is actually for the benefit of, you know, the domestic audience yes. where there is mass support for Hamas and mm. mass support for the annihilation of Israel. Yeah. And everyone's going to pretend that that's not the views. But, you know, oh, Jordan's changed. You know, Jordan has a massive Palestinian population, mm. huge, huge percent population, and they pay lip service. Same in Saudi. The Saudi, the horrific, horrible, totalitarian murderous regime in Saudi. But sadly, preferable to the alternative, which is the mad mullahs being in charge or, you know, the Iranian uh, mad mullahs. I mean, that's the reality. We don't get a choice of the, the, the perfect government uh, in, those in, in those countries. Uh, we don't get a choice of the government in Israel. That's up to the Israeli people. But mm. at least they are democratically elected, whether uh, we like them or not. And I think you have to look at actually the programmes and the progress that a lot of Arab governments have taken. Because you have to say, actually, even though they're not starting from the best place, there has been a lot of progress. Yeah. Why is that? It's because they've seen that when they fight wars against Israel in the past, it doesn't work. But also they've learned 
the lessons of the Arab Spring, which is that actually, if you foment a lot of anger and a lot of radicalism in your populations, sometimes it can come back to bite. And it will turn on you, indeed. Yes. Well, look, I mean, there's no doubt at all that, you know, we've got the um, six-month anniversary of the, the uh, Hamas attack on Israel on, on this Sunday. Um, I mean, you know, no doubt, um, you know, the, the pressure is going to be up. A lot of people saying, well, this war's been going on for so long. We were in Iraq and Afghanistan for <laughs> years. I have no idea uh, why people think, oh, there's a deadline. There is, there is no deadline no. for making your country safe. I rather wish that we'd make our own country safe, perhaps by, you know, controlling the number of people who come to this country. Let's talk about... Um, particularly uh, um, people we don't know who they are, who destroy their passports and pay uh, the uh, people smugglers uh, over in Calais. Y yesterday, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, did an interview with the political editor of The Sun, that's Harry Cole, um, in which he said, Britain will quit the European Court if that's what it takes to stop the small boats. Um, he's threatened to end the UK's 71-year tie to the European Convention of Human Rights, which, of course, is tied up with the court. And he said, I believe that border security and controlling illegal migration is more important than our membership of any foreign court. Uh, and he basically said that, the, the, you know, the UK will quit the Eurocourts to stop boats if we have to. Uh, so basically, in the event of the Rwanda bill not going through, in the event that you know, there's more and more legal challenges... At the next election, whenever it is, and he wouldn't confirm when it is, October, November is the most expected date now, he, he said that, you know, to paraphrase, we will go to the public with a manifesto. Well, we could, sorry, we could mm -hmm. go to the public. There's a lot of provisos in there. We could go to the, the public with a manifesto saying we will quit the European Court if we are elected. Now, do you believe that he wants to do that? Do you believe that he would do that? Do you believe he's, it's an easy thing to promise when... You must know, if you're Rishi Sunak, the odds are you will never be elected in the next general election. Do you know what? I'd say no, no, and actually no, even to the last point. Um, and that's because, actually, I don't think that they would even have the gumption to promise it, knowing that they wouldn't do it, because I don't think they're confident enough to put to the British people, we will leave the ECHR, and then withstand the barrage from Labour, which would be they're trying to take away your human rights. Yeah. Because they don't have the confidence or the alternative mechanism to present to the British but not, public. But it's not just a barrage from Labour. If it were all the other political parties, perhaps mm. not Reform UK, they would support that. Um, but but it would be from half of the Tory party. Yeah. The bleeding hearters who claim they're the moderates who are busily, happily allowing, you know, yes. hundreds of thousands of people to be in this country who don't have any right to be people here. People seem to believe that until the end of the Second World War, there were no human rights in Europe or anywhere in the United Kingdom, and that if you get rid of or try to amend or update this, uh, this, this body, there will be no human rights again. And... I would say the same as the people who said if we left the EU suddenly there would be have, no sky. We'd have, yeah, there'd be no sky. <laughs> no, but the idea, but the idea that yeah. we we had no human rights, we we we've, we've had, we had you know rights, you know, sex anti sex discrimination act and things like that long before the I EU. I mean, the great irony is that actually England, rather than Britain in general, England has led the way in terms of exactly. actually and putting in place what what would be considered human rights laws throughout history. We tend to lead the way uh, on this sort of thing. Uh, but look, honestly, is it going to happen? No. They can talk tough on this, but. And I would sympathise with this, which is, do you trust the Tories? Forget Labour. Do you trust the Tories to actually come up with something better than the ECHR? Look at what they've done with Brexit. They've taken all of the wonderful opportunities and they've done absolutely nothing with it. They've managed to turn people against it. They've managed yeah. to make it unpopular. They've managed to take very little advantage of anything. What do we think they'd do with the ECHR? I suspect something similar. I don't trust this current iteration of the Tory party to get it right. Well, look, this ties in with uh, another topic I want to talk about, and this is this latest YouGov poll. Just the latest... The long line of absolutely mm. dire polls uh, for the Conservative Party. Uh, and this poll suggests a absolute wipeout for the Tories. Uh, the, the discussions seem to be now about sort of, you know, how bad is it going to be rather mm. than whether or not the, the, the Tory party will lose. Again, I've been following all this stuff for a lot of years now. I'm all long in the tooth. Um, and... Um, I don't say, I always say never say never. Events, dear boy, events, mm -hmm. uh, as, as famously said in the 70s. Uh, but this but this latest uh, poll, which is a, a massive poll, it's a mega poll, uh, 18,000 people, um, so across many different constituencies. And it's forecasting Labour will win 403 seats. That's a gain of 201, a majority of 154 over the Tories, crashing to just... 155 seats, so they would lose 210. They'd lose more than half of their MPs. This would be a worse defeat for the Conservatives than John Major had in 1997 mm. uh, when Labour uh, under Tony Blair left them with just 165 MPs. And, of course, you know, 
when we see you know, the absolute devastation that uh, we saw under Jeremy Corbyn for the Labour Party in 2019, mm. this is on a different scale from that. Now, do you think that this is likely to happen? Do you think that vote for Labour is going to be that strong? People are so fed up. Or do you think actually the Labour vote is much softer than people think? And what a lot of Tories seem to be counting on is that on the day, mm. people will go, the things I'm angry with the Tories about are things that I think that Labour will do worse. No, because I don't think people will come out to vote for them. I don't think they'll get to they'll the just stay at home. in the first place. I think the key thing, you're right, the vote for Labour, the support for Labour is soft. It's not enthusiastic. But the Tory party right now are sitting there waiting for the inevitable uh, defeat to come. Uh, they're not putting forward. You know, I would expect a government in this position to be rather aggressive, a lot more bullish, uh, to be putting forward policies that might, in fact, uh, on the face of it, seem to be rather unpopular, but that they turn around to the public and say, look, you might not like it. This is the situation we're in. This is what you need. They're going to lie to you, Labour. Let's hear what their policies are. Things like energy, things like housing, you'd expect them to be going, right, well, we're going to lose on current trajectory anyway. Yeah. So let's actually put forward well, in place some okay, policies. That, that that's people all very work. well, but that sure. lack of consistency, because any, any, you know, any, any member the public can go, mm. well, hold on a minute. You're basically saying we need to have a policy yeah. to, to basically, you know, count them on exactly the policies that you have been perpetrating yeah. for the last 14 years. Mm. So you've got it all wrong. I mean, again, oh, is, know, yeah. I'd love Rishi Sunak to turn around and say net mm. zero is insane, it's unachievable, what on earth we were thinking. You're the people who sodding signed up to it. But this is why, ultimately, if they were going to do that, they should then set the deadline for the general election and say January, say we're going to do this, this and this by then. And if we haven't done this by then, I know it's a very short amount of time, then you don't vote for us. But Because people are not going to vote for them anyway. On the subject of Labour and their support being very soft, Partly it's very soft because they're not being very concrete about many things yeah. at all. They're just going to be more of the same. They've got no Big money state, to do anything. No reform, anything like that. It's going to be more of the same. They know that that's going to be very unpopular. It's going to be cultural. There is what also, it's going to be because the only thing they're going to have left is cultural. But they're also worried about Gaza, which is the fact of the matter is, as things currently stand, they'll win a stonking great majority. But with that confidence that they will, you increase the, op the potential that a lot of would be Labour voters might go, do you know what? I'm not going to vote Labour because they're going to win anyway. I'm going to vote for the George Galloway style candidate yeah. who is making this a single issue thing, or for the Green Party candidate or in certain seats. So there is a chance there that actually a lot of their support is eaten away almost unexpectedly because yeah. people just assume, oh, they're going to win anyway, I might as well give a protest vote to this smaller single issue party. I yeah. think they're quite worried about that because there are a lot of seats in the UK where these sorts of things are quite important issues, especially Gaza, actually. And, you know, we've seen how sort of reticent Keir Starmer was to sort of take a firm stance one way or the other. You know, even saying that they support Israel, he wasn't incredibly massively vociferous about this. So I, I think that there is real concern there. The question about Reform UK, it's a great unknown because they take votes from the Tories predominantly. They could take votes from Labour in those sort of former red wall seats. But we don't actually know what, what they're going to be come the next. Will Nigel Farage be leading the party? Will it be Richard Tice? What kind of candidates are they going to be putting forward? Will they be people you know? Will they be unknowns? It's very difficult to gauge. What I would say is at this point, they're doing quite well given their base. But I think if the Tories, with the Tories doing as badly as they are and with Labour's vote as soft as it is, I think quite sharp as should the next couple of by-elections, the Blackpool by-election, for example. Yeah. You need to see them actually overtaking the Tories in some of these places. If they're really doing as well as they say and the Tories are doing as bad as everybody believes, they need to take second place in one or two of these places. Okay. Otherwise, people probably won't vote for them in the next election yeah. because they'll say it's just another insurgency. Um, can I also ask you about another big factor in the election? Because we talk, you know, we know, you know, all the different issues, and again, mm. gas is going to come in. But for most people, it's it's going to be the economy. Yes. The economy's stupid, as mm. the Clinton campaign always said. Uh, and also, of course, uh, you know, there are issues like immigration. Again, even if you're in an area that's not affected by it, people, you know, people are waking up to this and saying this is an issue, yeah. an impact on housing, an impact on the cost of living, of course, mm. uh, but also the NHS. Mm. Um, extraordinary. Uh, new statistics from the Office for National Statistics suggesting that the seven and a half million people that we've got on the waiting list currently actually is missing two million people who actually are on waiting list. They just don't count anymore mm. because they've well, basically already had an appointment um, and, and, and you're just waiting for the next appointment. But you're in the system, so we counted you as having been seen. When we do find it, I mean, I found it absolutely extraordinary, especially when we see the, uh, with the, the King and uh, the Princess of Wales both mm. being treated uh, for cancer, and, and I wish them the best in the world and, and every recovery, but they will be getting the best healthcare money can buy. That is not what most people in this country get, unfortunately. Mm. I want everyone to get the best healthcare money can buy, but um, it is the case that it is now routine that more than half of people, this is official stats, more than half of people, they go to the doctor, they get a referral to an urgent referral, suspected cancer, to see a consultant. That's before you even get any tests or anything. They wait 
more than two months. Now, that is obscene in a first world country. It is obscene in a third world country. But that is, that is the matter between life and death for an awful lot of people. <clears throat> so these two million people will include people who are, well, they're on the list. They've already, yeah. they've already had the first appointment, <clears throat> but they haven't actually had any treatment or follow on treatment yeah. to cure them. This is terrifying. It is. And again, I think the government should be honest with people as to why this is. We all... It is not down to the doctor's strike. You and I had conversations throughout the, the pandemic saying that there would be a price to pay for the NHS and the price is being paid. And it's not just about the lockdowns and everything, although that has played <coughs> excuse me, a very large part in that. The government has to be honest and say, look, we haven't necessarily planned long term. Us and previous governments have not necessarily planned. We didn't plan properly for a pandemic or we didn't... Didn't uh, plan it, properly for anything. Yeah. But ultimately, what will alleviate this crisis is training more people from a younger age, increasing capacity, that takes time. Yeah. And it's going to be one of those things where they go, look, we did this during COVID because this was what we thought was the best thing. This is what a lot of people want. Let's let's not get away from this. Don't, for some don't, reason, don't start me on it. Don't reason, start it me on it. Closing to, closing down the NHS yep. to people in their 30s with cancer to make sure that someone who's 86 yep. can live an extra six months. Brilliant but what decision. they now need to do is say, this will be sorted, but it will take time. And it will mean training more people, it will mean more places, and they will have to also say this cannot be alleviated by importing people from third world healthcare systems no. that we haven't trained and also aren't trained to the standards no, necessarily that we demand. And we will also need to find a way of retaining doctors and nurses who are already here. And have um, a lot of that is going to be paying people, but this is the thing I don't understand. We are piling money into the NHS. I mean, huge sums of money. People say, what about that 350 million quid a week the NHS was supposed to get extra? They've had that and oh, yeah. more. Uh, and, and post COVID, they've had that and more. Mm. And yet that money doesn't seem to be going anywhere. We just seem to have so many bureaucrats. I yes. would have thought that some sort of social just, you know, social insurance system like most of Europe has, mm. we're told that that actually has increased bureaucratic costs. Well, how can it have more bureaucratic costs than our current system where we don't have enough beds, doctors and nurses, but we spend as much as every other country mm. with similar health, well, better healthcare outcomes mm. um, on their NHS. And similar dem their demogra they have similar demographic yeah. issues and countries like Italy and Spain, they actually have much worse demographic issues. They still perform a lot better than we do. Um, it's one area where I'm interested to see whether the Labour Party will be able to make inroads that the Tories haven't. Where We're streeting, streeting yeah. has been very good on this. Uh, about there's again, no money and there needs to be reform. When you've got the Labour Party saying that, that's when you Most know it's really the, I mean, Such as the NHS has been privatised, bearing in mind GPs have always had private yeah. contracts, such as their private healthcare has been used as part of the NHS. Most of that happened under Tony Blair. Yes. Of course it did not under the Tories.